multitude of environmental issues, concerns, factors that uh, are of prime importance when uh, looking at the Himalayan uh, ecosystem. Now the more obvious ones of course, uh, which one uh, relates to are floods. But there are others which are minor subsets uh, of other environmental concerns which we need to really look at from a short term and long term perspective because there seems to be very little Himalayan environmental planning in our country. Individual project level uh, environmental impact assessments do take place but how effective those are, how in depth those are and how forward looking those are, are all very questionable. So the one environmental uh, devastating impact that most comes to mind to people of course is that relating to flooding because it is, causes the most devastation, the most number of deaths, injuries, damage, loss in a very short period of time. Now floods are something that are not new to the Himalaya. Indeed we had the Gohanatal uh, flood and the glacial burst that took place maybe a hundred years back in the region of Kwari Pass and the Rukkul area in that uh, wider Nanda Devi uh, basin area. other lakes that have burst, we've had rivers that have flooded, but nothing was perhaps as devastating, shocking and uh, damaging in terms of deaths as the Uttarakhand floods that took place close to a decade ago now. Uh, the numbers that were officially touted were something like 10 to 15 to 20,000 deaths, but the actual number may have been close to 100,000 deaths because bodies were found till years after and many people were on the missing list who never made it to the list of dead because their bodies were never found. So that flood uh, and flooding incident was the most shocking and the reasons for those floods were basically entirely relating to human development having taken place around our river systems. Now when you go back to uh, the Uttarakhand region and the kind of developments we've had there over the last 100-200 years, the British were the ones who really uh, pushed new hill station towns in Uttarakhand. We've always had villages and uh, small townships and uh, uh, temple destinations, the Chartham have been there for eons. But the British created the new hill station towns of Nainital, Shimla, Masuri and multiple other hill station towns. Now when you look at these hill stations, they were all traditionally located on ridges. They were all located on prime high altitude ridges which looked over to the Himalaya, looked over to the plains and had prominent uh, uh, locations with enough uh, flat land for constructions to take place, for military bases, for sanatoria and uh, lots of sunlight. So when you moved up to the mountains you wanted lots of sunlight because the weather was already cool and so all these hill station towns were developed over the last 100 to 100 years. Now what we as an independent India have done since independence has been to push the agenda of religious tourism and access to the higher reaches of the Himalaya which are typically uh, required 
not for mountaineers and explorers they were never a priority but for or trekkers or tourists and travelers but for religious and pilgrimage religious tourism and pilgrimage so access to gangotri yamnotri badrinath kedarnath in garhwal or amarnath in kashmir or mani mahesh in uh, himachal or these destinations was of prime importance to the local uh, gov- uh, governments state governments national governments and what we found is that the recent char dham interlinking uh, roads that have been uh, planned and which are being actively developed are heavily impinging on high altitude critical wildlife tree plant shrub bird insect habitats of the himalayas and the kind of road building that we are seeing happening today is absolutely devastating because roads are being built with enormous jcbs bulldozers uh, trucks which weigh 5 to 10 tons with uh, when fully laden and these trucks are being uh, run on mountain roads that are very recent newly created all the malba the waste uh, well the rock the mud the soil everything being generated from that road building is being taken away for creation of pushtas uh, embankments and rock walls but a lot of it is going down because when a bulldozer works on a new road all that malba is being thrown down the hill side now that malba acts like multiple missiles weighing from 5 kilograms to maybe 5 tons each that just goes shooting down the valley for hundreds of meters causing complete destruction to the forest uh, around to the undergrowth the understory and you know in the process killing birds birds eggs nests uh, animal habitats because all this takes place in the summer months when birds are breeding and so it's completely causing devastation it's ruining water channels polluting them with uh, soil and uh, debris it's ruining bird habitats and nesting at a time when it's taking place at its peak and these roads are uh, being built at an un in a completely unplanned fashion with very very little long term planning so when an incident takes place like the one that just took place last month in february in uttarakhand in a very localized area albeit um, as a result of this glacial lake having burst or some other similar incident which i think everybody is not even sure about when this happens suddenly these things come into the spotlight and we all have a knee jerk reaction and say oh what's the cause global warming climate change let's blame all the big guys let's blame all the big factors but the fact is we are not doing any rational reasonable amount of planning at the local level at the regional level project level leave alone at the national level or the himalayan ecosystem and mountain range level there really needs to be a lot more planning between pakistan india nepal bhutan but we are not doing that uh, there are bodies that are supposed to be coordinating such uh, developmental works and activities across the himalayas but that is obviously not happening and what happens as a result is that the knee jerk reaction actually causes more damage than good but the damage that's actually taking place continues because roads are still being built at an alarming pace the
damage and downstream uh, fallout from those road construction projects is continuing and what the government generally wants whether it's one government or another is to give people access is to allow pilgrimage and religious tourism to continue because that's where the large numbers are and everyone loves large numbers so uh, everyone wants to give people access Gangotri is already motorable Kedarnath is virtually motorable and uh, Badrinath is motorable Yamunotri is the last one standing but believe me very soon even that will be turned motorable and so it works for the development agenda of the state and the centre to have all these pilgrimage locations to be made motorable now motorable at what cost? no one's making that call, the judgement call no one is planning out the long term uh, ramifications of such rampant road construction work so road construction seems to be the number one uh, reason for flooding and environmental impact in the Uttarakhand Himalaya at least and definitely across the rest of the Himalaya as well. So, um, when the British built their hill stations, it was well planned and on hill ridges and I'm not praising them for that, I'm making a mere observation. When we post-independence started doing our construction work in the Himalaya, it was mostly along the river valleys. So our roads were made maybe 10 feet, maybe 15 feet above the river uh, flow. Instead of looking at the 100 year uh, flood patterns, instead of looking at the long term uh, flow of the river and the high flow and the low flow and the fluvial geomorphology of the rivers we have just left 10-15 feet and started constructing now where you have a road you will have temples you will have shops you will have thabas you will have uh, local uh, support for all of those so homes and commercial establishments and everything starts burgeoning along those roads in the mountains and it's natural So when we've not planned out the high flow of those rivers and we built our roads 10 to 15 feet above those roads, these incidents are going to happen because development follows those roads and when you've not planned out your roads, all the development is going to see a 10 year, 15 year hit from glacial debris flow, from rockfall, from various other forms of environmental impact and uh, uh, effects that are going to continuously take place in the Himalaya. So our roads have been badly planned, we continue to make poorly planned roads and that uh, development agenda continues and there's absolutely no going back on that. So when we want to blame global warming and climate change, we really should be looking at our local situation on a project basis and see where that's going. Now we all blame dams and yes, dams in the High Himalaya are damming. They can cause enormous amounts of Jauli Ghat has been damaged by a flood that's just come up there, the Maneri Bhadi Dam. There's a lot of uh, malba and rockfall that's happening there because the uh, entire river valleys are being shaken up by uh, movement of JCBs and tractors and uh, trucks and bulldozers. And even apart from that, uh, the Tehri Dam, much maligned, 
actually played a role in mitigating the effect of the Uttarakhand floods of 2013. Because when that huge flow of water came down, the Terry Dam actually absorbed a major part of that heavy flow in the summer months when the flow of the Ganga was at a low ebb and prevented further downstream damage from happening at Rishikesh and Hagwar. Now I'm not saying the Terry Dam is good or bad, I'm making mere observations here. In that particular instance, the Terry Dam served a positive uh, purpose. But dams really, really need to be figured out. I think what we need to have are pico hydels and micro hydels at the village level, at the local authority level, where villagers can actually take care of those small projects and get 10, 20, 50, 100 kilowatts of power instead of us trying to chase megawatts of power at the cost of enormous dam projects that will eventually silt over and that will eventually get to be useless over a period of time. Now that said, sand mining is illegal and we have an excess of uh, sand in the Terry Dam. So maybe there can be a way of uh, giving licenses to dredge the excess sand in Terry Dam to reduce the, uh, the, the sand uh, content that is reducing the effect of, effectiveness of the dam and turn it into a useful project where we can actually have dams So we have to look at everything without getting emotional about it. Look at the environmental impact, the scientific rationale behind every project and the good and bad, the positive and the negative and weigh all that in balance. Similarly for river interlinking. Now I'm not going to go into river interlinking because that's not directly associated with the Himalayas. But we are jumping headlong into environmental projects that may or may not have uh, sufficient gain for the country and which may have questionable uh, environmental uh, benefit for the rest of the country. So we really need to look at all these factors before uh, blaming a much larger uh, series of factors such as climate change, which of course has a role but may not be the entire uh, reason uh, for these localized incidents from taking place. Of course, earthquakes is yet another uh, environmental aspect which is unavoidable and which we have not taken into account. Because when that big tembler does take place in the Himalayas, it unplanned uh, and incalculable loss and damage, the kind that happened in Kathmandu some years back. with the kind of development that we are allowing to take place uh, in hill stations like Masuri and Shimla. I recently saw a parking uh, project in Masuri, which was the most enormous 
parking project I've seen anywhere in the mountains. Enormous girders uh, spreading across three stories on a hillside. Uh, the whole uh, building must weigh thousands of tons. The kind of impact that's going to have on the ground and if an earthquake does take place. I don't even want to get there uh, about the kind of damage that could happen if uh, a massive earthquake occurs in the Himalayas. So we really, really need to do our long-term environmental planning from the perspective of rock falls, glacial slides, floods and earthquakes. The Himalayas is an, an ecologically, geologically, geographically vulnerable zone and it is subject to change. Remember the Himalayas is still growing at a couple of inches a year. So it is a young mountain range as opposed to the Shivaliks which are an older mountain range. So we really need to look at the long term picture whenever we embark on any projects in the Himalayas and not just blame um, uh, the larger big picture but look at what really good is going to come out from each of these projects and weigh and balance that as opposed to the political gain that may come out from certain such projects and initiatives. So in balance, uh, the Himalaya is ecologically fragile, yes. Species level, there's enormous ecological fragility. Uh, there are species that are possibly going extinct. The mountain quail has not been seen since 1873, for example. That may or may not be due to environmental reasons and may be a species level ecological loss that we have experienced. But there are species that are going up and down in number and we need to monitor those. And I don't think there's any Himalayan Ecological Monitoring Agency. The pheasants are a highly vulnerable group of uh, uh, bird species that we need to be looking at. Ungulates such as the Bharal, Thar, uh, Goral, Serao, these are all groupings and species we need to look at very carefully because their habitats are being fragmented. Uh, tourism, uh, religious tourism, religious infrastructure development and all these other factors are things we need to really be strongly concerned about. I mean making this enormous paved cemented uh, boulevard in front of the Kedarnath temple is possibly asking for trouble because when the next big outburst comes from whether it's Chorabari Tal or a glacial flow or whatever all that cement is going to act like missiles lower down the valley and destroy the forest below there. But why look at one local area? We need to make a Himalayan agenda for environment and we need to share this with Bhutan, Nepal, Pakistan and India and talk on one platform and discuss all these various factors from ecological species level to environmental and uh, geological and put all this together because the next big earthquake will come, the next big flood will come. These are things that are cyclical, they come and go and we are going to have these issues over the years. And the last one I want to really bring up here is groundwater. The Himalaya is one of our North India's major sources of good, clean, drinking, potable groundwater and for agricultural purposes as well.
So when all the streams empty out into the Dehradun area or the Kovet Terai side uh, or anywhere else in the lower foothills, uh, Siliguri and Bagdogra side on the, uh, uh, in the West Bengal or in Arunachal near Pasi Ghat or uh, in the Palampur hills of Himachal, all these areas are the catchments and the areas where the, the water is going entering into the groundwater and then comes up below and is used by all our residential and commercial developments as far away as Delhi. Now even in Delhi when you look at the flood plain of the Yamuna, we have abused it. We have built the Commonwealth Games uh, village there. We've gone and built the Akshardham temple on the uh, historical high flow flood plain of the Yamuna river. Now you cannot control the flood plain of a river. So when there is a big flood, all these areas will see major effects. We've already seen hundreds of buses at the ISBT terminal uh, underwater when we've had flooding and that was not even a major incident. So when the next major incident comes, we will abuse climate change, we will blame global warming and lay it to rest right there. But the fact is we have misused the floodplains of our rivers and we continue to turn our rivers into open sewage drains for all our residential and commercial sewage to be dumped into because we do not have enough STPs to drink that sewage and uh, we are going to run short of water. India is going to see a major, major groundwater uh, reduction and fresh water availability crisis in the next few years. And it is the Himalaya that is going to recharge those groundwater basins, aquifers and streams for us. So the more we do uh, judicious and adequate planning of the Himalaya, the more we will all as a subcontinent in India benefit from that. And we really, really need to look at creating a ministry for the Himalaya in the government and uh, fill it with scientists and environmental brains as opposed to bureaucrats. And we need to do some long-term planning for India so that we can all enjoy the Himalaya as adventurers, mountaineers, birders, uh, entomologists, zoologists, or plain religious pilgrims. We all need to respect the Himalaya and appreciate it for what it is the finest geographical. The Himalaya, many things to many people, Mount Everest to some, pilgrimage to others, the Yeti or the abominable snowman to many, Bhutan and Nepal to yet others. Few outside India associate the high peaks of the Himalaya with India. And yet, more Himalayan geography falls within India than outside it. From Kashmir to Arunachal, 
the entire sweep of the Himalayan mountains hold a fascinating range of floral and faunal types that change with altitude, aspect and latitude. Ibex and the blue sheep or bharal are the prime high altitude ungulates of the high Himalayas. But there is one Himalayan animal that has so confounded wildlife programming and television companies around the world for many decades now. Top notch wildlife camera persons have been consistently tasked with going out and filming this animal in the wild, more so to try and obtain a sequence of it hunting and making a kill. All have so far returned empty-handed. While some camera trap footage has come in and lots of distant footage of the big cat on the prowl, or even some high-speed chases across craggy cliff faces, No one has managed to film the animal in successful hunting action. The big natural history producers and factual television channels started from the 1970s and right through till the present time. Tens of millions of dollars were spent. Crews were in the field for years. The best cameras and lenses put to work but no footage came in. All this changed in March 2018. Wilderness Films India, a factual production house based in Delhi, succeeded where all else had failed. We not only obtained the first ever sequence of a snow leopard successfully making a kill in the wild, but we also obtained the most spectacular hunt footage ever recorded in the history of wildlife filmmaking. Watch this video to see just what set apart our efforts from the rest of the global wildlife filmmaking pack. A two-year-old female snow leopard is on the prowl at around 14,000 feet altitude in the high mountains of Himachal Pradesh. She comes across a herd of ibex on a rocky mountain face interspersed with deep snowpack. After positioning herself higher than the ibex herd, she gets ready for the chase, even as they suspiciously eye her moves, preparing for their escape, but also sort of transfixed at the impending danger and unable to make a move. Once she starts her high-speed gallop, they take off and what follows is a treacherous chase across rocky boulders and snow on a relatively steep rocky face. The hunt peters out, however, and the ibex gain distance from the snow leopard as they are the dominant species on the rocky cliff face. She realizes it is hopeless and gives up. After catching her breath, she narrows down her interest on a pair of Himalayan blue sheep or bharal that are grazing on dried winter grasses atop a cliffy landscape after separating them from the herd. A calculated chase follows. She is lapping at the heels of the bharal male. She takes one leap and catches hold of the blue sheep. But soon, hard ground gives way beneath both of them. Whether she has calculated the distance to the edge of the cliff, or this development takes her by surprise, they are both off the cliff's edge now and spiral downwards together. The bharal is in the tight hold of the female ounce or snow leopard. And when the two do fall together, the snow leopard cleverly cushions her own fall over that of the blue sheep 
and in that moment of extreme gravity-fueled impact, the Bharal gets a chance to break away and escape. But the hungry and desperate snow leopardess has not gone through this extreme fall for nothing. She lunges forward and grabs the Bharal back in the grasp of her paws and mouth. They fall together several hundred more feet, bumping and thumping their way down over the rocks, taking on huge impact and lacerations. The snow leopard twists and turns her body in the air, anticipating the rude fall at the end of the approximately 400 foot fall off the cliff. Finally, the flight and fall end and the triumphant snow leopard has a subdued bharal within its grasp. She is injured and bruised, but nothing that a few days of rest will not take care of. She proceeds to enjoy the fruit of her labor and hides away in an adjacent cliff face for shelter. of the next few days, she uses natural ice packs to nurse her bruised haunches and leg muscles. She sits in the snowpack in the hot midday sun. She also nourishes herself with the fresh blue sheep meat. She repairs herself completely and is back in action on a full belly. Not exactly another life in the day of a snow leopard, but this young female snow leopard demonstrates to us the extreme conditions that occasionally challenge its very harsh life in the high mountains. Yet this fascinating animal continues its unique way of life in the high Himalaya, far from the prying gaze of human beings. The following season, in the winter of 2019, we return to her cliffy rock faces and found her faring well and back in hunting action. We distantly followed her to check on her condition and she has no lasting effect of that fall and is dexterous and adept as ever. Hopefully she will have cubs this year. The snow leopard has a wide habitat range indeed despite low numbers throughout. From Mongolia in the north to its southern range in the Himalaya, where it is found from the Chitral and Kashmir regions all the way into the eastern Himalaya in Arunachal Pradesh in India. The snow leopard leads a solitary life in harsh and unforgiving conditions. Yet, 
It is the master of its habitat and the supreme predator of its altitudinal range. One in ten hunts or even less is a success and much energy is spent on each such attempt. Yet, a snow leopard must keep trying in order to feed itself and its cubs. Indeed, even the adept can falter, as with this snow leopard that literally fell off a cliff while walking across it. As one moves further west and north from Himachal to the high altitude Trans Himalaya Ladakh region, one finds communities involved in protecting the snow leopard, an elusive but strikingly beautiful species. This mysterious cat inhabits alpine and subalpine areas at an altitude of 3,000 to 4,500 meters. The snow leopard ideally preys upon burrell and ibex, which live in the same altitudinal range, but will also take a shot at a marmot or a pika or something similarly small. At the same time, it is not averse to bringing down a much larger and heavier yak, zoo or similar bovine, sometimes taking on the wrath of local villagers when it does so. But despite living close to human habitations, there is hardly any disturbance to snow leopards from local villagers, and the snow leopard itself has never been known to attack or even threaten a human being. Resource crunch on the snow-clad mountains leads the leopard to hunt villagers' livestock, resulting in man-animal conflict. This rare big cat that lives in these high altitudes has risen in number thanks to the effort of the local villagers and the influx of high value off-peak tourism revenues in the difficult winter months. Thanks to better stewardship of the habitat, and an increased ungulate prey base. So long as the snow leopard remains, the mystery of wild places in the Himalaya will remain and the lure of the wild will be intact. Indeed, as Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote, what would the world be once bereft? Of wet and wildness, let them be left. Oh, let them be left, wildness and wet. Long live the weeds and the wilderness, yet. <laughs>